Hi, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for introducing me. Uh, what I would like to do to start with is to thank the organizers, Professor Kim, Professor Ok, inviting us. Uh, and as usual, Professor Ok has arranged everything in, in detail. Perfect. Um, now, what I would like to do today is to give you some general idea about how we can orient our environmental research for enhancing ecological resilience. But I will pay more emphasis on the PTS, persistent toxic substances. Um, and now, to start with, a bit about myself. Uh, I was born in Hong Kong, born and brought up. And um, first time I went out of Hong Kong, small area, 1,064 square kilometer. First time I went to England, and then I was trying to do my MSc in ecology, Durham University. Um, so I was on a British Council scholarship uh, at the airport. I was met by a, a beautiful <laughs> young lady, a volunteer, uh, to receive me, uh, because I, I was a British Council scholar, you see. And um, when we crossed the street, she held me tightly. Uh, I felt very good. And, and she said, <laughs> and, and she said, oh, yesterday there was a student from somewhere. He had not seen any cars before. And then I said, me no see cars before. And so she held me even tighter. <laughs> okay. Uh, so much for the joke. I have a bit more for the drinking session. Uh, how, how do you? I'm sorry. Getting a bit forward then. Oh, okay. And, uh, point based. Okay. Um, now, the major act, uh, objective, as I mentioned, um, I will try to show proper management of toxic chemicals. It's very important to ensure uh, a sustainable society. So, what I would like to do is to use some case studies. Uh, I will go through them quickly focusing on southern part of China, including Hong Kong. Um, now, there are three pillars of sustainability, social, environmental, and economic. And of course, environmental uh, pillar is the most important. Um, in terms of ecological resilience, I think it re refers to an ecosystem to respond to disturbance resisting damage and they can recover quickly. So all these um, problems like natural disasters and also human activities, now I would like to focus a bit more on human activities on pollution. Um, when you look back to the history, uh, starting from 1930s, 1940s, in terms of uh, environmental monitoring for water pollution, we tend to focus a bit more on bacteria because all these bacteria, uh, they will, they will um, end up with a lot of diseases and then eventually sediment and for water pollution, we, we then paid a bit more emphasis on BOD, on nutrients in the early 70s like nitrogen and phosphate, which will cause eutrophication, and then we measure chlorophyll A, and not until late 70s and early 80s, we started to look, look at heavy metals, heavy metals, all these toxic metals. And then eventually, persistent organic pollutants like pesticides, um, DDT, and so on, endocrine disruptors, and then emerging chemicals of concern. Uh, 2010 uh, and onwards. Now, um, all these chemicals, they are, uh, we, we, we then eventually find out a lot of these chemicals are supposed to be safe at, at the beginning and then eventually we find out they are not so safe. Uh, we call them emerging chemicals of concern. And then the end, end points will become smaller and smaller and then we, we need to invent a new equipment in order to detect them more, more accurately. Um, now, uh, the chairman mentioned that I took part in this uh, 
um, regionally based assessment. It was late 1990s. We were trying to to um, to manage uh, the the launch of this exercise, and um, at that time the world was divided into 12 different regions. And I, I was lucky enough to look after the Central and Northeast Asia. And at that time, we were able to look at all these toxic chemicals. Now, at the beginning, we focused a bit more pers on persistent organic pollutants, POPs. And then eventually, uh, we tried to, to look at other toxic chemicals which are also resistant, uh, persistent. They are, not so, uh, they are not degrading so easily. And then emerging chemicals of concern uh, are all these uh, chemicals, including nanoparticles, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, and, and so on. Um, now, lessons we learned from pollution, from these pollution studies, I, I think human beings, they, they, uh, we were very clever. We try to make use of uh, certain organisms which have been uh, evolved to, to um, metal tolerance. For, for example, the case of heavy metals. They are terrestrial plants. Uh, they, they have to go through natural selection. Uh, we call them e evolved tolerance. Um, it was Professor Bradshaw, whom I worked with uh, for about a year, and I learned quite a lot from him. And then application would be phyto stabilization, phyto extraction, and then Alan Baker, uh, who is supposed to be the, the world leader on hyperaccumulators and so on. So we make use of these organisms and try to remediate all these toxic, uh, toxic sites. And then uh, later on, we look at some wetland plants, and then we found out most of these wetland plants, they are bone tolerance. There's a, another term called constitutional tolerance. That means they can uh, remediate these toxic uh, sites without going through um, uh, evolution, mostly because of the an anatomical structure and other mechanisms. I, I don't want to go into details. Uh, for the application, it would be vital filtration using uh, constructed wetland, using the plant roots to filter out the pollutants. Um, later on, I think it would be important to use scientific output, uh, scientific inputs for environmental management. Uh, this is a personal experience. Quite some time ago, 15, uh, 2002, I took part in a, an investigation on fish kills at fish culture songs because of the dredging and disposal of sediment uh, on, on behalf of civil engineering department. And at that time, there wasn't any EIA, so uh, it created a lot of problems. All these fish were killed, and um, the government has to pay a massive sum or compens compensation for these fish farmers. But later on, um, 2013 and 2017, I uh, involved with uh, another project which is uh, very similar, but at this particular time, we, we have EIA and then very string, stringent environmental monitoring and audit program, and then I serve as an independent review, reviewer for the water quality monitoring and implementation of mitigation press, uh, measures. So every three months, I, I will have to write a, a short report a re review based on the data we, we collected from another company and try to work out whether the dredging disposal activities will create any problems uh, to the ecosystem. Uh, now, I would like to focus a bit more on the Pearl River Delta, south, southern part of China, which is the most developed region. Uh, it has a rapid economic growth, and it has become the world center for electrical, electronic products, and also other industries. Um, so at the same time, all these industries will emit a wide range of toxic chemicals. To, to cite an example, uh, these are the chemicals emitted from textile industry, only textile industry. <laughs> all these dyes, all these PFC, PFOA, and so on. You can imagine other uh, industries, they would emit another batch of 
toxic chemicals. So recently, we were talking about zero discharge of toxic industry in the Pearl River Delta. We were approached by the Hong Kong Productivity Center, and we tried to work out uh, some time scale, but I think this would be a very slow process. Uh, so basically, uh, the problems we, we have in southern part of China, including Hong Kong, would be urbanization. People are moving from, from very uh, remote area to find jobs, industrialization, emitting a lot of chemicals, and the change of land use. Um, now, all these lands, um, the supposed to be good farm soil in the past where we produce vegetables, but somehow it has been used for, for storage purposes, for um, repairing cars, and more recently, uh, storing all this electronic uh, waste. Um, now, Hong Kong still uh, have its territory, although, although we, we have joined China uh, 1997. When you go through uh, from Hong Kong to China, there's still a checkpoint. You, you have to present your Hong Kong ID card, and then I have a mainland ID card, and then you go through. So um, in, in the past, the, because Hong Kong uh, has been a free port, so all the ships are coming, and um, a lot of illegal shipments, uh, electronic waste, but now the, the border is getting tighter. So all these electronic waste are now in our own backyard. Uh, now, what happened? All these toxic chemicals emitted in a densely populated city like Hong Kong. So all these toxic chemicals they come from different directions, from agriculture, open burning, flushing into the toilet, uh, all these consumer products. Eventually, they end up in sewage treatment plants. Now, bearing in mind that these sewage treatment plants, when they were built, they not intended to break down toxic chemicals. Um, so we, we have a bit of problem uh, recently. Um, in a project, well, two, two three projects uh, commissioned by Drainage Services Department, we were trying to look at the removal efficiency of this PTS by different types of soil treatment works. Um, so we have tested a wide range of these toxic chemicals. Um, now, to cut this story short, the soil treatment process, they are not so efficient, removing uh, all the toxic chemicals. And what's more important, there are certain congeners formed during the treatment process may be more toxic than their original congeners. So we may have some problems <coughs> because eventually some of these uh, sewage effluent will carry these toxic chemicals into the coastal environment whereby there would be uh, food chain, uh, bowel accumulation and bowel magnification. Um, well, if you use sewage effluent, sewage sludge for land application, then you have uh, other opportunities of these toxic chemicals entering into our food chain. Um, now, in addition to this, um, sometimes we will find illegal, illegal addition, toxic chemicals added into beverage and food. Uh, cite some examples, melamine, I'm sure you heard about this, creating a bit of problem, and also phthalate, plasticizers, uh, which was happening, well, found out in, in, in Taiwan, uh, actually. Um, it's an endocrine disruptor. I think it was, uh, it was big news about seven, eight years ago, and then they found out these phthalate uh, has been used as a clouding agent in drinks. So we, we, they add them inside, and, and then the drinks look cloudy. It looks giving you a pleasing color, sort of texture. And um, I'm not so sure whether this is linked with one of the lowest birth rates in Taiwan yeah. in the world. I don't, I don't know. It would be interesting to find out. Um, now, so food safety would be a very important problem. When we talk about food safety, it would be microbiological hazards, it would be chemical food contaminants, and then the GM food. And in my talk, uh, I will concentrate on food 
contamination. So in terms of toxicity, post potency, um, it will depend on the concentration and the types of food contaminants, and there would be short-term effects, high dosage. Uh, when we talk about mercury, it would be uh, Minamata disease as a, a very classical example. But nowadays, we tend to worry about a long-term low dose, which may, may create cancers and histolo uh, histological damages. So what I, I'm uh, interested in is the geochemical cycles of these PTS, which may become food contaminants linking to health problems. Um, case study one, uh, the, the, this was carried out uh, quite some time ago when we were trying to look at the tea plant, uh, which is an aluminum and fluoride accumulator. Uh, at that time, I had a student from southern uh, India, and we worked on this, um, and borosis can be caused by drinking a large amount of this low quality tea, which is called brick tea. But, but this picture is a good, good quality brick tea, actually. So this poor quality uh, tea, they made use of old leaves, where they concentrate, they accumulate large amounts of uh, uh, aluminum and fluoride. So we need to understand the growth condition of these tea plants and and the transfer of aluminum and fluoride from soil to plant, and then from products to tea liqueur. Um, now, if you uh, know a bit more about tea plantation, they will find it, um, they, 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 they like acidic conditions under pH 4, 4.5, and under such acidic conditions, the aluminum silicates will be dissolved easily and then the aluminum and fluoride will be taken up and, and then uh, they will try to accumulate in the old leaves. So when they uh, shed the leaves, perhaps this is the way to get rid of the high concentration of aluminum and fluoride. Now usually when we uh, make, when we have our tea, the best tea would be the flush, the, the butt and then two or three leaves underneath. You pick those and then you make good quality tea. Whereas the, these poor quality tea, they will make use of any, anything left, all, all leaves which contain high concentration of both aluminum and fluoride. Um, and case study two, arsenic and arsenic causes, I'm sure you heard about this. Um, so in terms of exposure, we have inhalation, uh, ingestion, including drinking and uh, taking food, dermal contact, and then Seafood contains a lot of arsenic, but fortunately, the type of arsenic in seafood will be organic mm -hmm. arsenic. And then um, in remote area in, in China, they have a habit hang, hang, hanging all these vegetables uh, inside the house above the cooking stove. But unfortunately, all these vegetables, they coated uh, contaminants, including arsenic, and then they, these people tend to develop similar sort of the symptoms, arsenicosis, um, like people drinking a lot of water containing arsenic in, in certain places in the world. Uh, now, we also add arsenic in, uh, as a feeding materials. Rosasong is a kind of uh, food additive controlling intestinal pe uh, parasites and promote growth, uh, increase feed efficiency. And also, uh, uh, arsenic is also added into, into some wooden structure. Uh, I remember Chao San, Zhang Chao San uh, did a nice study, um, and um, we work on, nice on this. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Um, so we th then later on, I took part in a uh, project with uh, uh, with the GIST in Guangzhou Institute of Technology, uh, and then we work on the problem, and we found out um, estimation of diet dietary intake of people who consume fish and who consume rice con 
uh, which contain high concentration of arsenic are exposed to um, arsenic. I have borrowed a picture from Professor Yong Guan Zhu. Remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2008, and he, he and his group did a nice work. Um, and then he, he was uh, one of the panel members deciding on the upper limit of arsenic in rice, right? Yeah. Yes. Co chair. Co chair, co chair. Uh, and then it's widely used in, in the world um, because China was the first one doing this. So, arsenic threat in rice. Is issued by FAO as a kind of warning. Um, and then we also uh, did something on the electronic waste recycling and public health. Um, so we found out uh, during open burning of electronic waste, they have emitted a wide range of toxic chemicals. And in the, in the open burning area serves as a toxic transformer, transforming uh, certain chemicals into a more toxic form. To give you an example, they, they burn uh, cable wires, they try to extract the copper inside. Now burning, burning these cable wires, the PVC, will act as a catalyst, copper, ca copper will act as a catalyst, so even forming more uh, toxic chemicals dioxin and so on. Uh, then we try to do a, a basket, food basket analysis and work out the uh, food items that are highly contaminated in the area, especially um, uh, seafood, fish. And um, they estimated daily intake of flame retardant and, and also other toxic chemicals and this one on, only show uh, PBDE. And we found out these adults and, and babies, they are subject to a high concentration of uh, toxic chemicals in, in the area. Um, even the epidemiological data from a hospital pointed out the abrupt rises of four major uh, diseases, digestive system, malignant tumor, cardiovascular system, respiratory system. So we have enough evidence. Um, so we worry. This open burning, uh, this uncontrolled recycling, they are not repeated in other countries, which needed, needed the cash. Um, and then we uh, have a project on mercury, fish contamination, and human health, because we worry about the long-term uh, low dosage intake uh, of mercury. And at that time, we received a uh, funding from Research Ground Council in Hong Kong and we were the leading institute uh, to tackle the problem looking at the mercury uh, issue, especially focusing on the agricultural, aquacultural zone. Um, so basically, uh, we, have, we have done a, a, uh, a project on examining the shark fins, because shark fins are very popular, and then we found out this is a, uh, a very good example of our bowel accumulation and biomagnification of, mer of mercury in top carnivores in, in the ecosystem. So we have a, a title, uh, shark fins may be a symbol of wealth and fortune because the Chinese community, community you, you treat uh, your guests to nice dinner with shark fins, but may be detrimental to your health. Um, and then eventually we found out uh, fish feeds would be the major sources of mercury because they use trash fish and also compound feed. Very often they contain fish meal made of this trash fish. So uh, this would be a problem. Um, and then later on we tried to conduct the uh, health risk assessment looking at all these common freshwater fish and marine fish uh, in, in Hong Kong. And then eventually we have done this, um, this analysis, uh, hazard quotient, uh, if the hazard quotient is higher than one, there seems to be a health problem, lower than one, it doesn't <coughs> seem to, to be a problem. So for bro both freshwater and marine fish, mercury seems to be a problem. Uh, later on we work with uh, 
the Red Cross, Red Cross in Hong Kong were able to collect some blood samples. We're trying to correlate the, um, the toxic chemicals in the fish and also in the, uh, in the general public. And then we found out there seems to be very good correlation uh, even with PBDE, flame retardant. The, uh, there's a good correlation uh, with the congeners. Um, later on, through the uh, uh, Dr. Lam, we were able to, to collect a lot of samples, uh, fatty tissues, uh, from some patients with uterine leomyomas, and then we tried to work out the seafood uh, diet, and we found out there seems to be very good correlation uh, with these patients uh, who have more seafood diet, well, higher frequency of seafood consumption, tend to contain higher concentration of these toxic chemicals. I know this is not very scientific, but it does point out the likely association. I think we need to work a bit more on, on this. Uh, I, had a, uh, I had a student who, who was a medical doctor doing this work, one, wonderful work. Um, now, another, uh, connect, another study we, uh, we looked at was the mercury related to fertility in Hong Kong. Uh, through the uh, information supplied by Dr. Lang, we were able to look at uh, all the, the problems with subfertile males in, in Hong Kong. And Dr. Lang looked at a wide range of um, uh, habits of these so-called subfertile males and uh, whether they, they had hot bath, whether they drink beer, whiskey, <laughs> Uh, and also where did they live, how long they have, they have been in Hong Kong, and then they, he narrowed down to two possibilities. Fish intake, if you uh, take in more fish, you tend to have higher concentration of mercury in your hair as an indication, and also the number of two amalgams in, in your mouth. Um, so mercury can be transformed to, um, to our second generation and more recently there seems to be more cases of autism reported in, in southern part of China. And um, we also work with another medical doctor, Dr. Go, uh, supposed to be the director of child health development and then uh, he, uh, he, she is a, is a woman, she received a lot of patients from different parts of China and then eventually she divided them into two, two groups. One inland, Beijing uh, inland group, they have higher uh, concentration of lead and arsenic, perhaps due to heavy polluted environment, compared with coastal groups like uh, Shanghai and Hong Kong. Uh, these autistic children, they contain high concentration of mercury and cadmium, perhaps a uh, high consumption of seafood. Again, I think we need to to do a bit more on, on this. So recently we have written up a, a review, Environmental Toxicants and Autism, and we have found out uh, in addition to heavy metals, there seems to be more and more reports about the problems of POPs, PBDE, and emerging chemicals of concern, including phthalates, like I mentioned, and bisphenol A, uh, all, all these products. Um, in Hong Kong, we have a food safety center, and then they also uh, had uh, done a, a, a piece of survey and a kind of warning. Uh, dietary exposure to methyl mercury would be a health concern to 11% of women aged 20 to 49. Um, so fish would be the most common route of exposure to, to mercury in, in general. And in addition to our own study, there are various reports about the same problem in different parts of the world. Um, prenatal mercury exposure and IQ, according to a uh, study, there seems to be uh, a good correlation, and then they made a the conclusion, IQ is a well-established endpoint used in <coughs> cost-benefit and economic analysis, the effects of environmental contaminants. Now, when you talk to the uh, policy makers, I think it's important showing that there are problems economic, uh, in, in the health aspects, there are problems in the economy, and then they will then listen to, to you. Uh, 
Tensa villages in, in China, I'm sure you, you heard about this, but uh, we don't have any, uh, I, I'm very surprised. Uh, we'll, I try to look at all these references, there are not too, too many. So we're still working on this. Uh, but in Hong Kong, we try to uh, compare the data, the top 10 cancers in Hong Kong, uh, 2014 compared to 2004. And we found out um, uh, called colorectum seems to be number one in terms of cancer, followed by uh, lung, followed by breast cancer, and, and so on. It used to be lung cancer, but somehow I think the air seems to be a bit better in Hong Kong. And col colorectum is become, coming number one. Perhaps it's because the food are contaminated and the, and the uh, habit in, in eating. So verdict organs uh, would be would be a indicator about all these toxic chemicals entering to our bodies. And then more recently, it came out October 19, the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health. So we ought to look at the uh, pollution and health problem. Uh, these two pictures, the first one, number of deaths in one million people, all forms of pollution. The second one uh, is related to water pollution. Uh, now, if you look back to the history, uh, we invented a lot of uh, these chemicals. Some of them uh, were doing very well, and then eventually, like um, DDT was banned, PCB was banned, and then the Basel Convention, Water Dam Convention, Stockholm Convention, uh, and so on. Uh, now, these conventions are very effective. If you look at these graphs, DDT, PCB, PCDD, di dioxin, there seems to be a declining trend. Uh, the, the contaminants in, in human milk, uh, this was carried out in a group of Swedish scientists. They have done wonderful work. But in terms of flame retardant, there seems to be a, a rock rise. Uh, the concentration doubled every five years, if you look at that graph. And that's why uh, flame retardant has been included in the Stockholm con uh, control list. I'm aware of the time. So management of PTS, it would be a world uh, concern. And then a few years ago, I also took part uh, in, in a survey. And then, and then uh, we tried to, to, um, to provide some information uh, to support the sound management of chemicals throughout their life cycle. Um, and, and we tried to look at uh, countries developing countries and also countries with economy in transition and heavy metal seems to be uh, still number one uh, problem followed by PAH and then all, uh, the third one is mixture effects. So, but again, there are so many new chemicals coming in. I think we need to have a better control to, uh, to construct a regional li list of toxic chemicals. I don't think I have time to go through this. Uh, in Hong Kong, we also have an uh, exercise carried out by the EPD, um, Toxic Substance Monitoring in Hong Kong. And then more recently, uh, we tried to work on recycling the food waste into feeding materials to produce, uh, produce fish which are safe uh, uh, and have higher quality, and at the same time, uh, safe space for our landfills. So we have received uh, three uh, fundings and we try to work on freshwater fish as well as marine fish. Um, and then we try to look at integrated wetlands for food production. Uh, the idea is to adopt polyculture to efficiently use natural resources. Now for polyculture of carbs, I think it has been very popular in the past um, because each of these species they have very distinct feeding modes they have their ecological niche so all the waste materials uh, all the energy nutrients could be fully utilized in such a in, in such a polyculture grass carp they stay on the top eating grasses big head they are filter feeders and then at the bottom might be a bit more competition they tend to eat all sort of uh, organisms. So last slide, um, I think long-term low dosage of PTS through food intake seems to be a public concern. 
I think we need to have a holistic, multidisciplinary approach to demonstrate potential health effects and economic loss. So the policy makers will then listen a bit more. I think we, have, we should have more stringent control and management of these toxic chemicals. I think we should focus a bit more on the PTS which are common in our region for better control because there's so many chemicals we need to narrow down into a list. And we need to understand the geochemical cycles of these food contaminants and of course clean up uh, toxic sites would be important. Uh, we activate local ag agriculture and aquaculture to save quality food and cut down footprint and carbon emission would be also uh, very important. So I've used up half an hour. Thank you.